World Wrestling Entertainment in their years and years of existence has firmly been defined by eras. Time frames in the company's history where different stars defined their image, they crossed over into the mainstream, and they created moments which are still replayed till this very day. Each era has an accompanying cast of marquee attractions and reasons to exist. From 1997 to 2002 was the Attitude Era. Then came the Ruthless Aggression Era from 2002 to 2008. This was followed by the PG Era. Then came the Reality Era, followed by the New Era. With each name that the company was given for their various time frames, it felt as though WWE from a television standpoint was growing more and more out of touch with their fan base. Yes, there was some good stuff here and there, but fans were just waiting for an improvement. But that turn in the right direction would just never come. The moments, the unpredictability, it was few and far between. At the end of the 2010s, it felt like World Wrestling Entertainment was hell-bent on self-sabotage and alienating their fan base, lacking a structure, missing out on top talent, coasting by with their pay-per-views, and failing to deliver fans the stars that they wanted at the top. Go back to 2018 or 2019 and it looked like the WWE was doomed to fail forever. Entering the 2020s, the WWE has finally found their way again. The company has gone through an overhaul from the top down, from new ownership and ideologies to pushing the new wave of superstars. The company has seen a massive turn under Nick Khan and Triple H where fans are finally enjoying the WWE for the first time in a long time. The company's had a resurgence across multiple facets from how the company is building up talent talent, a new vision for media, and even a complete overhaul of their developmental to fit into a grand scheme of an overall plan that seems to be clicking. After some really tough years for fans which were filled with frustration, bad television, and spite booking at times, the company has gone through a renaissance. By its literal definition, renaissance means rebirth, and a rebirth has happened within the WWE. And you may think the simple answer is Triple H taking over. But there's all these little pieces that make up a much bigger picture that finally has the company clicking. So let's rewind back. In 2020, WWE hired Nick Khan as their president and chief revenue officer. Khan came into the WWE after working for CAA as their co-head of television. The company hired a seasoned media mogul who brought in a different philosophy on television. He came into the company and changed how the WWE distributed their content and operated their biggest pay-per-views. Earlier in 2020, WWE had parted ways with George Berrios and Michelle Wilson who had been with the company for 11 years. When asked about why this happened, Vince McMahon said the company wanted to focus on growing the value of their content and that the decision was based on a different view of execution over areas of focus. Dumbing that down, Vince didn't think they were focusing on where the money was and he had a different view on what they should be doing. In came Khan and immediately changed the company. By the following year, Peacock became the official home for the WWE's content library in the US. They entered a multi-year agreement with NBC Universal and were able to settle on a $1 billion rights agreement. The company launched the WWE Network back in 2014 with hopes that it would seamlessly fit into the streaming landscape, even though it hadn't exploded yet. Think the WWE's version of Netflix, a signature app that had content upon content for a bargain of a price. This was going to be big time and for some time it was, but as time went on, those subscriptions started to flatline and even drop. The company made the decision to sell those rights. Essentially the thought was, where can we plop the WWE logo and have more fans see it? If they couldn't have people coming to them, then they'd go to them on a bigger platform. Nick Khan spearheaded that and was able to make the best of a downtrending situation and it was his business savvy that helped get that deal done. But where the company has really changed since his hire is their pay-per-views. Go back to 2018 or 2019 and pick a pay-per-view, chances are you'll feel like you're watching a glorified version of Raw or SmackDown. Now their roster is the strongest that it's been in years and the company is putting on some huge cards, but they do it in bigger venues and different markets. Going back a few years, there would be very few shows that were inside football stadiums or baseball parks. Now there's more of those which give it a grander feel and that goes hand in hand with what I mentioned earlier. The biggest change has actually come with WrestleMania. The grand feeling that came with WrestleMania has finally been restored for the past couple years and why it's working is the two night structure that the show now has. Again, 
Go back to those shows in 2017, 18, 19, close to the five hour mark for almost all of them in terms of runtime. WrestleMania, though it was one of the biggest shows in the world, at times felt like a chore to watch and it lost its sparkle. Instead of being a showcase of the best storylines and matches, it became this five plus hour marathon where the company crammed as much as they could onto one show. So you'd usually get lukewarm critical reviews once these shows were done. Since Khan came in, WrestleMania has expanded to a two-night format, night one Saturday and night two Sunday, which allows for more breathing room, makes the show much more digestible, and also gives the company the ability to space out their big matches. It was a change that at first seemed odd, but now seems reasonable that it happened. This change has led to more ticket sales, partnerships, and big time matches. The rejigging of what and where a pay-per-view should be since 2021 is what's worked and that falls under Khan, who is a key piece in WWE exploring these different markets. Also, pay-per-view fatigue doesn't seem to be a thing anymore. They don't have a pay-per-view every month just for the sake of doing it. You don't need a TLC in December to fill a spot on the calendar because if you end off your schedule in November, then the next one isn't until the Rumble in January, which fans will be hungry for no doubt. SummerSlam went from arenas to stadiums. The WWE started to do more international shows and all that came under the eye of Nick Khan. That hire in 2020, though simple for most fans, has had an unseen effect on the WWE. WWE, for their entire existence, has also been able to maintain connection to the entertainment industry because at the core of it, they are an entertainment company. Music and television helped the WWE launch WrestleMania and get to new heights. But there was a point where it felt like the WWE was trying their absolute hardest to hold on to that relationship with the mainstream. Problem being, there was a huge disconnect between what they thought worked and what actually worked. The company brought in stars like Snooki, Jerry Springer, and Kevin Federline to continue to show that they were still relevant. Heck, they had an entire era of their flagship show have a cast of changing celebrity guest hosts to maintain that relationship so very desperately. Sometimes it was good, most times it was bad, and sometimes it was flat out cringe inducing. But those celebrities didn't really do much for the WWE in the grand scheme of things. What's a one-off appearance really going to add aside from your hardcore fans rolling their eyes at some very forced segment? Now this is a model that the company has ironed out. They finally figured out how to incorporate names from the outside. Whereas before the goal was let's just bring in these guys and use them in a segment for a bit, maybe force them to wrestle even though they have no intention to and they don't really care, now they have them seamlessly fit into the company. At the top of this is Logan Paul, one of the biggest names in combat sports and multimedia. With him he brings a reach of millions. His addition to the company seemed pretty harmless on the surface but he's been able to give the WWE an exposure among young adults and fans who maybe don't follow the company but follow what Paul is doing, even if they're just hate watching the guy. The biggest tool he's got is his online reach and the ability to market. Just look at how many views his impulsive podcast gets. It's these crossovers that are working and helping people like Seth Rollins be seen by those who wouldn't know who the guy is. And it's going both ways. The WWE gets eyes on them because people want to see what Paul's doing and by working with him, guys like Cody and Seth are being put into this mainstream avenue where they get some more exposure than they normally would have because of the built-in fan base that he has. Even if the exposure is so simple as to, yeah, the wrestler that was on Logan Paul's podcast, it helps them get those names out constantly and not just for a one-off. What's an added bonus is Paul is a natural athlete and he's come into the WWE and made big time waves. The believability factor is there because he can go in the ring. They've kept him a special attraction where he only wrestles at the biggest shows two or three times a year and he's been great for the WWE. Instead of an ever revolving door of people that serve a single time purpose and that WWE fans couldn't care about anyways, they finally figured it out. Same thing goes for Bad Bunny, one of the most popular artists on the face of the planet. His appearances in the WWE have helped them garner huge mainstream headlines because he brings that worldwide reach. These guys both wrestle and do well, and again, it goes both ways. Fans care, so do media outlets. How do you pique someone's interest who won't watch the WWE? Here's someone you may know, 
they're actually wrestling on our card and they do it a few times. Opposed to here's a celebrity paraded out without any rhyme or reason, please put it on your website. Who are the ones that can land you on the big time publications? Who are the ones that can help make waves for it? Again, both Bad Bunny and Paul started appearing in 2021 under Khan's reach. I think maybe when we started even bringing in like Logan Paul and Bad Bunny into it, and just seeing like... Even Bad Bunny's match at WrestleMania, I guess his first mm -hmm. real match at WrestleMania, I guess 37, that I feel like people were starting to go, oh, Bad Bunny's part of this? Yep. Oh, I've, I haven't watched wrestling in a long time or I've mm -hmm. never watched wrestling, but I like Bad Bunny. Mm -hmm. So now I got to start watching. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of eyeballs on Lots. what you guys are doing. Like you said, more now than ever. Overhaul seems to be the word of the video and I'll continue diving into it with NXT, which was another necessary step that needed to happen in order for things to become one functioning machine. The NXT brand has been around for over a decade and what initially started as the company's replacement for the ECW revival became a cult classic among fans who were jaded with the WWE's main roster. The focus on Raw and SmackDown was the big jacked up dudes who were the textbook definition of wrestlers and stories that felt like they changed course every minute. Meanwhile, on NXT, they had a different in-ring product, a product that a lot of fans wanted to see. They were slower with their storytelling. You had to look for those Easter eggs and they kept rewarding you for following the product. The brand had their peak from 2015 to 2019, so you can imagine the outrage that came in 2021 when everything was stripped away and the super indie once again transitioned into becoming a farm system. The focus became less on short-term gain and instead creating future stars that had the star power and athleticism to become big names in the WWE. And early on, it was a tough watch. Nickelodeon NXT was rough because they stripped it all down entirely. They wanted to do things their way, and looking back at it now, I mean, I said it back in 2021 too, but it's a step that needed to happen. The rebrand came out of left field, but it's since settled nicely. It has a nice blend of young wrestlers, some stars from the main roster, and the in-ring quality that fans loved back in the black and gold days. Again, another overhaul done by Triple H and Nick Khan. What we want to make sure is easy for folks who want to be WWE superstars is figuring out how to become WWE superstars. So if you think of the life of an elevated athlete throughout their career, the opportunity to go play somewhere has always been easy. Being able to play somewhere is not. That's what's hard. But if you're an amazing high school football player, colleges come after you, you get recruited, you go into their system, and either you make it or you don't make it. Again, all that it takes to get there, very difficult. But the system, not difficult from my point of view. So we want our system to be an easy system where people who want to be superstars, they know how to get to us and we can get to them. We don't want to just keep doing that same thing. We want to look elsewhere for great young talent. If you streamline your developmental, if you make it simple, it works. A key branch off from what he said is the WWE Next In Line program where the company recruits college athletes and gives them the option of becoming WWE superstars, so you could potentially have the next Brock Lesnar on your hands. And when looking at NXT, two of the big stars of the future are Braun Breaker, who came in from football, and Tiffany Stratton, who came in from a gymnastics background, both completely molded by the WWE. Both wrestlers who look like pillars of the future, they came in with no wrestling training, they were built from the ground up, given time to find their way, display their athleticism, fail, figure out what works, what doesn't, and all the subtle nuances, that wouldn't have worked with the black and gold audience. They wanted the big veteran signings from ROH or New Japan. With AEW becoming the landing spot for a lot of those talents, black and gold really didn't need to continue to do the same thing. I link it back to sports, it's a farm system, and before that farm system had next to no connect with the actual big team. How are people going to get familiar with these guys if you don't give them a chance? How are they going to learn if they're just expected to be good in ring? How are they going to continue to sustain their success? And now there's a connection between the farm system and the big team. When they have Braun Breaker appear a few times on Raw, they give Carmelo Hayes a shot. Tiffany Stratton was working with Becky Lynch and they're slowly weaving them in. 
here's our prospects and here's a little tease they're young they're building up and soon they'll be on the main roster remember way back when when they didn't even do that vince would get his hands on someone from nxt and have no idea what to do with them he would just see someone have no idea what they're about and repackage them that instead is happening in nxt so it again comes back to things fitting together properly and those call-ups are not fumbled anymore it's the biggest connect that the two sides have had since that crop with page big e the y it's the shield that crop of talent was brought up nearly a decade ago and they fumbled so many wrestlers in between that time in the renaissance era though the biggest change comes at the top in 2022 vince mcmahon was forced to step down from his role in creative many fans had been beaten into submission at mcmahon's philosophy of booking oftentimes random poorly crafted and nonsensical he focused very heavily on part-time wrestlers of eras gone by which sometimes put their health in jeopardy and he sabotaged the progression of superstars of the future to discredit Vince McMahon is completely wrong. I mean, without him, the company isn't as big as it is. The man is responsible for having a vision that no one else did. But he was disconnected with the changing times, disconnected with the fan base, and would coast by because, well, it was his company. The 2010s are the scapegoat in this video, and they'll continue to be. Under his watch, the company missed out on so many top stars by giving them lukewarm pushes before they'd fade into obscurity, and they'd essentially be the forgotten toy that was the shiny one for all of what, one episode of Monday Night Raw? With him, sometimes it would feel like you were being force-fed what he wanted to give you, while what you wanted was intentionally dangled in your face and not given to you. Now with Triple H, that's completely changed. He's able to introduce talent slowly and keep them a constant on WWE TV. I made a video called the WWE's New Wave. In it, I discussed how people are finally getting a chance. There's an investment being made in stars who will carry the WWE now and ones that will be there for the foreseeable future. And again, linking it back to a sports team, it's about depth. How much depth can you create in your organization? It's about having those guys take over once the big guys are gone and building around that core. Building so you don't have another big dog situation where it's like, oh shoot, our top guy is on the way out. Let's strap a rocket to someone. Instead, here's those talents. Let's let them simmer and slowly they'll come up when the time is right. NXT fits into this plan, call-ups are working, and wrestlers who are organically over are given the chance to prove why the WWE should run with them. It's a huge, huge contrast to before where molten hot acts would emerge, fans would be cheering their guts out, and they'd immediately be made to look like comedy acts because they didn't fit Vince's vision. It links back to what I talked about earlier. You need a connect from upper management and the talent, and right now, that connect is there. Under Triple H's eye, the company has focused on doing what a television show should do, and that's storytelling. A key difference is instead of it being a 30-minute episode, it's one concurrent story that seems to have logical start and end points. He's also focused on giving fans a great in-ring product, which he was a huge fan of in NXT. The WWE finds himself in a similar situation to the Ruthless Aggression era where they had stars of a previous generation plus ones that are slowly building up. And when that happens, you have limitless possibilities. Now I do want to point out that not everything has been perfect under Triple H. There are some people that give him blind credit without looking at his flaws and he does have a lot of them. But at least there's structure. Under his watch, the WWE has been quite strong. Look no further than CM Punk. They were able to repair their relationship with CM Punk. Who knows, in an alternate universe where Vince is still around and the WWE is not the same, maybe his ego gets in the way and we don't get CM Punk back in the WWE. They're open to doing business with others and with other companies. They've also proven that acts from other companies can come in and be treated as big time. Cody is the key example. When he came back in 2022, people thought, all right, cool return. But the company proved that they could go out, get free agents, and have them immediately have a sustained impact. Cody's arrival into the WWE laid the foundation for others to come into the company. Being able to lure free agents into the company, I don't know if that would have happened a couple years ago. 
The last one that connects this whole thing together is Roman Reigns' heel turn. A heel turn that finally made him the top guy that it didn't feel like he was back in 2019 and even early 2020. The turn gave Roman the autonomy to tell his stories, and by virtue of him being the top heel, everything else just slowly built under the top star. If he was still a face, realistically, who would your top heel be? Would you have all these crazy moments? Would guys like Jay, Sammy, LA Knight continue to get that big time exposure if he wasn't there? Him being what he is has allowed Cody to become the face talent that the company desperately needed. If he was still a face, those two would be duking it out and who knows if Cody would even be in that same position. So by virtue of having that top marquee name, that huge draw, everything has built underneath while he's still the main attraction. The WWE era we're in is being called the renaissance era and it makes sense when you actually look at how well the WWE is functioning, it makes sense as to why things are clicking. A few years ago, it wasn't like this. Everything seems like it's intended with one company in mind. There's not this sense of just waiting for something to fall apart from an on-screen perspective. As fans, you don't feel like, okay, when are they just gonna screw us over? The pay-per-views are fun, everyone's getting a chance, the WWE has developmental clicking with stars of the future ready to take over, WrestleMania is back, and they understand how to remain in the mainstream. Since 2021, the WWE has adjusted in various different assets, and small and simple tweaks, plus Triple H taking over in creative, has given the company new life for the first time in a long time. Though, even the WWE's biggest defender can't say it's all perfect, because it's still not. It has gone through a big overhaul though. If you want great in-ring matches, they have it. If you want your soap opera pro wrestling characters, you have those too. If you want tag team wrestling, well, that's slowly being built up. The excitement, the unpredictability, and most importantly, the trust within the WWE and their fans is back. It's finally a well-oiled machine that's in working order, and that working order wasn't something that seemed possible at all a few years ago. Fans were just so hell-bent on crapping on the WWE, and let's be honest, they deserved it. They deserved every bit of that because they were churning out garbage. Now, the company is finally back to being the sports entertainment giant. In the comments below, let me know, is this the best place that WWE has been in in the past 15 years? What's working for you, what's not, what changes still need to be made? This is the fourth of a series that's almost happened on accident. I made a video talking about how garbage the WWE was at the end of the decade. There's one talking about the pay-per-views and how they've gone from chore to charm. And then the new wave of talent that the WWE is finally developing. So check those out because they link back to this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'll catch you guys in the next one.